Hello and welcome to Bottled Up, coming to you from the Appel Center for the Performing Arts in York, Pennsylvania. Uh, we've been doing Bottled Up for the last few weeks as a way for us to talk about not only how it feels to be bottled up in society right now due to uh, the coronavirus, but also to think about on a wider scale what it feels like to be bottled up inside with something, maybe something we don't even know what it is, but to have the performing arts come along and crack us open and have us discover something, something that ultimately changes our lives. So over the past few weeks, we've been talking to different artists from all over the country about their experience with the performing arts, cracking something open inside of them and changing their lives. Today's guest uh, has become a friend of mine over the last few years. Uh, I first started searching for this man when I was creating a Shakespeare curriculum for York, and I realized that my small experience with Shakespeare meant I was gonna have some big gaps teaching a diverse group of students. So I was searching for someone who could help unlock various cultural diversities within Shakespeare and making those relationships, making those connections that I couldn't make. And uh, I was amazed when my guest, Keith Hamilton Cobb, responded to me right away, shot a text back, was super friendly. He's, he's honestly one of the most poignant, intelligent, sincere, and honest people that I have met in a long time. Some of you may know Keith from the Sci-Fi Channel series Andromeda, where he created the role Tyr Anasazi. Others of you will know Keith from his work with The Young and the Restless. But I know Keith not from those two uh, characters so much as his work called American Moor. And I won't tell you any more about that because the man is here and he can tell you in person. Keith, welcome to Bottled Up. We're really honored to have you. Well, thank you, Tom. Happy to be here. And after all the nice things you said, I really got to do my work here. <laughs> no, I think that comes pretty naturally. Um, so I, I want to just jump right in. I want to jump right into this idea that the arts, let's, let's first of all take that premise and let's pick it apart and say, you know, that's true or that's not true or that's true in some ways or my experience says, let's go right at this. Is it true in your experience that the performing arts have some magical key that can get inside of us and unlock something that nothing else in society can? I think it's absolutely true uh, if, if it's done right. Uh, wonderful adept theater can do wonderful things and, you know, stinky theater does, <laughs> for, for lack of a better term, stinky things. Uh, so it certainly has the power to uh, open and change hearts and minds of uh, those attending. Uh, the process for theater makers is always revelatory. There's always something being uh, discovered. Uh, so it works on both sides of that equation. Yeah, I think that's very interesting because right away when you said, you know, bad theater can do just the opposite. Bad theater uh, can actually have an ill effect on us. It absolutely can. I, you know, I, 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 I think about this a lot in our current historical moment because I think our American theater has gotten to a place where it actually leaves a great deal to be desired. And if you look at healthy cultures, they have healthy theater. They embrace their theater. They go to their theater for answers to difficult questions. They want to do the work of introspection, uh, looking inward and figuring out their, their, own, their own humanity, the humanity, the cumulative humanity of, of, of the culture. What are we doing? What's working right? What's working wrong? How do we address this? And that's what theater is supposed to do. That's why they go. And so in healthy cultures, they support it. They give money to it. They give money to the actors who make it. Uh, they say, here's money. Go make it good. So, so you can answer our questions. Um, the looking inward part, I think, I, I love what you said on that. Sorry to interrupt you, but that That's really right. resonated because I think 
you know, in my experience, trying to go out and find those theater experiences that truly do something rich, that truly enlighten, that truly unlock something in me, it's usually not the big spectacle. It's usually a, a work. Not that there's anything wrong with the big spectacle. I like those shows. I enjoy going to them. But it's usually work created by small groups or experimental groups that really are looking inward to try to create something. And I think that process of truly going inward, getting gut-wrenchingly honest with yourself and trying to produce a manifestation of that, when that gets out there, I, I do believe it has a greater chance of really cracking open the nut of humanity in a personal way for people. I think you're right. And you said something that's operative and that is when it gets out there you know uh the interesting thing is that uh, the big spectacle and i agree with you it has a place you know joy joy is an essential nutrient to the human condition uh joy laughter uh, uh awe you know of the big ballyhoo uh thing uh it, it, it's important but a steady diet of that uh takes us away from the, the more difficult questions and sometimes or answered, you know, and you'll find that the smaller venues deep in some hole underground somewhere, there's this group with nothing to lose because they haven't got a dime figuring out the tougher questions. When they do come to the surface, when you do have the chance to see that work, it's always mind blowing and, and, and expansive and in, inspiring. Yeah. In, in, in a culture, that is predicated upon unregulated capitalism. <laughs> you know, it is, it is, it is the unfunded uh, little ragtag group with nothing to lose that is doing the tough work because, because they have nothing to lose. You know, they're not necessarily selling uh, what they're showing you. They're, 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 they're at it for other reasons. Yeah. And that's interesting. Um, this is not um, an interview about things that cracked me open, but when I think back of two things in particular, without fishing back, just as we're discussing, you know, these prompts that are happening. One happened in North Adams, Massachusetts, where there's a there's a great modern art museum up there that I like to go to every few years, and they had an experimental company come in from uh, from Quebec. And, you know, one of those things, almost no props, very little costume, but it penetrated me, you know, that does nothing to lose groups. And the other thing was, I think when I was younger, the Bloomsburg Theater Ensemble, which is a pretty well-established theater company now, at the time, they were a fledgling company and uh, they did a production of the Bacchae, you know, as a teenage, kid, I had no interest in Greek theater. I really don't know how I got there, but I remember it opening my mind to the idea that the artifice could be done away with and you could produce a work of art without an artifice between the artist and the audience. Couldn't have verbalized it then, but that unlocked something in me. So all that to say, Sometimes it is these fledgling groups that are really internalizing, discovering, remanifesting that to us and, and hitting us where nothing else can hit us. And maybe that's a good time to talk about American more. Sure. Uh, Unless you wanted to go a different direction there. No. Um... It's uh, it's always tough because I, I American more is, is 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 such an expansive pro project in terms of what it uh, the subject matter and what it deals with in terms of my experience with it over the past seven years. There's so many things to to discuss in terms of revelation in terms of cracking open. You know there was this great revelation that this piece was what it was when I started. I was just trying to express my human experience as best I could over the 50 so of, or so years of life uh, at, at the time and needing to uh, express that, to, to, get, to, to, to get that out of me. 
and realizing because of audience reaction to it that it was a piece about people in general, about everybody's lives, about, about all of us who are, are, are certainly sharing this culture and the way it's constructed. So yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, do, you want, I, uh, I, do I need to talk about what American War is and what- well, I hear, I, I understand your hesitation. And for, for our audience, let me just say, it would take Keith and I too long to unpack American More and, and what it's all about. I would encourage you to look at it. Um, maybe, maybe Keith, you could just offer a synopsis. I'll, I will tell you that Keith, for I believe seven years, probably his whole lifetime, but seven years on the journey of producing, writing a one-man show in which Keith plays a character auditioning for the role of Othello. Uh, a brilliant piece, which he took to San Francisco, New York, uh, London, he, to one of the stages, the Globe Theater, and eventually the show went all the way to Cherry Lane Theater off Broadway. Uh, so, Keith, did I do you justice for a short version of that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, it helps to say that the play is about, about uh, race relations uh in, in 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 race politics in in the united states in our culture and how they affect everything that we do uh across the color line uh including theater including how we make our theater uh and and within that there are any other number of things myriad things that the play is about but that that sort of does it does it justice and of course when you begin to plumb truths about these issues that we live because they are so deep and intrinsic and inextricable and have existed for so long because of the structure of racial bias in our country is, 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 is so difficult to navigate. You rattle cages and make other people angry. Uh, and those two, for the cr creative, for the, the theater maker, are revelatory. So again, we're back to that idea of cracking one open. You know, you, 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 uh, every step of this process, you are getting immediate reactions to your actions and uh, processing those and moving forward. And each one is, 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 is a revelation. So this process has been you know, hugely revelatory to me. Uh, and, 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 you know, I mean, I don't know if you can put a, 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 a judgment on it. I, would, I, I was about to say not always in a good way. I don't know if there's any such thing as a not good revelation, but... I was thinking that very Truth thing. is difficult. Yeah. Sometimes um, those companies that are doing that kind of work or your piece, which I witnessed in the process and already felt those workings of cracking open and getting to the deep stuff, the real stuff. Um, sometimes if you crack the wrong thing open in the wrong place, it can work against you. And I was going to pose a question earlier. Um, I mean, you, you have a great deal of experience both in television and film. Um, from the production standpoint, from the writer standpoint, from the performer standpoint. What do we do to not only protect, but to encourage this kind of soul-seeking work to be done? It's a, it's a difficult question. Um, again, I, this all leans towards the political um, delusion in our contemporary culture, right? Anything, but I mean, they're new, they're chasing dreams. They want a job, they want a TV show, they want a big paycheck, and they want to have a nice life. Right. They're not necessarily thinking en masse. I mean, it's a blanket statement. I'm sure there's some that are, but in, 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 in generally, they're not necessarily thinking, I need to take this instrument of mine, which is unique, and speak truth, find truth, discern truth, make art about truth, and give that to the masses. It would be great if 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 they all did. Uh, the 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 theater education institutions can assist in that if the, if they want to. Uh, 
uh, and should. Um, they can all be improved. Um, the platforms for uh, young talent to have access to, 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 to funds and support uh, can, can, can be improved. But how much of this is going to happen in, in this culture, which, which you know, prizes profit above anything else? So if I can sell the American consumer 15 different versions of Frozen and they'll buy all of them from me, uh, it is not great incentive for me to search for or put forward or create or market work that has distinct relevance. Uh, to, our, to our culture, which has the potential to uh, be in some way transcendent, to uplift uh, the society, to transform it. And it is in dire need of transformation. Uh, so that's where we are. Yeah. You know, I find that my, many of my students, uh, you, know, you know, at least at the high school and early college years, they, they assume that those experiences they've had watching Frozen or something like it, that those are the deep breakthrough experience. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to pan that, that's fine. But I think when you experience a piece that really goes deep and that really touches upon something, some truth in humanity that has up till that point either felt 100% private to you or something that you didn't even know was in you. Mm -hmm. When you see a piece that touches upon those things and you have that very deep aha moment, uh, at least for me, there's, there's sort of no turning back. <laughs> well, that's, I, I think that's absolutely true. I think it's profound for anybody who experiences something like that. It's getting them to have that experience, right? or actively searching for it as, as a steward of, of, of young minds and hearts who are uh, aspiring to do this work, you know, it is our job to search for those moments to show them, to turn their attention to, hey, have, have, have a look at this. And I was lucky, some, some of those just fell into my lap. There was nobody looking for those, those moments uh, for me, per se. But I, let me go back to something you were saying a minute ago before I forget it, and that is, it is terribly important to, to, to nurture the talent that just wants to be the singer dancer, wants to be, I mean, that, that, again, that is, that is yeah. in, important to rise yeah. to that and be wonderful at it is a worthy contribution. Nothing, nothing wrong with it. So uh, it, it's very important to me that nobody looks at this and feels like we are disparaging. Yeah. Well said. Broad, Broadway theater as a thing. Yeah. But to get back to where I was, you know, the first theater piece that I saw that made me want to consider any sort of a life in the arts was a high school production of Arthur Miller's The Crucible. And it was, it had all the earmarks of a typical high school production. It was amateurish. It was, you know, there were obviously very young adults playing adults. Uh, um, the, the production values were, were, were low you know, uh, they're, 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 but there was enough talent on the stage given that text, which is still one of my mm. favorite pieces of text in the Western canon. And we went on a whim. I was, we, you know, we're looking for things to do on a Friday night as 17 year old high school boys. We go stand in the corner and wait for somebody to buy us beer. Then we go sit in some park somewhere and drink it. And then what do we do? So we end up in the, we end up in the theater and I was riveted by this story being told, even in this compromised form, they were good enough to make me forget yeah. that they were my, my, my peers telling the story, you know, on a stage acting. And the story was so moving to me and remains so moving to me. And I thought, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe I want to do that. So there's, there's, there's that moment. And beginning to pursue that through uh, the, the various vicissitudes of my male African-American life, created other frustrations, other roadblocks, other awakenings, because you are dealing with uh, these stops in the process and having to navigate ways around them or through them 
or being turned back by them. Yeah. And each, and each, each, each stop is a revelation of some sort. Mm. Uh, you know, the next, after that, I saw, I saw, I saw a, a great deal of theater. I saw, you know, I saw James Earl Jones and Christopher Plummer do Othello on Broadway mm. uh, a, a, after high school at some point. I can't remember the year. And that was almost the absolute opposite experience. I thought it was horrible. Yeah. I, wa I, 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 watched, I, watched, I watched Christopher Plummer, God bless him, chewing scenery. I mean, talk about a ham. Oh. I mean, just, just taking over, running, putting Yago in his pocket and running down the street with it and leaving poor James Earl Jones standing there trying to, be, to bring some level of dignity to this character who was written with none. So that's a whole nother, nother, nother thing to get into at, 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 at some other point. But watching this, me saying, you know, this is, this is, this is, you know, the crucible was much better. <laughs> you know? and, and, and here I am thinking, this is what I aspire to. This is horrible. You know, so there's a revelation. Go down several years down the road from that. Coming back from 12 years in LA and, 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 and working as, in TV and film there to the extent that anybody would let me, to the extent that I was able, which was rife with growth and revelations, right? Not all of them positive, sure. as it were. Coming back and somebody saying, you know, there's this French company, Théâtre de Soleil. And there's this, there's this, this woman, Ariana Manushkin, and they're doing this piece at the Park Avenue Armory. Do you want to go? It's six and a half hours long. And I thought, six, well, how, do I, how do you do that? I said, well, you have dinner. You have dinner in between. You have three hours, and then you come back, and you have another three hours. I said, okay. I had no idea. And this piece was called, uh, I have, I'm, I'm terrible at French, but I believe the pronunciation is l'ephemere or the ephemeral. Uh, six hours of looking at moments of unremarkable people's lives. And the very fact that we isolate the moment makes it remarkable. So it is about the profundity in the mundanity of our human existence. And they were just vignettes that rolled across the armory stage in one side, not the other on little rolling platforms. And if you blinked, you missed one, you know, and the next one came along. And on them, these people are having these little bits of life. And it was absolutely stunning for seven hours, mm. sitting there watch, watching this, and then talking about that afterwards and saying, well, how come we can't make theater like that here? And the, the answer is because we don't have a commune on the edge of France to go to, wholly funded, to sit and make our theater for months on end, right? We come in and we do our three weeks, two and a half weeks of rehearsal for whatever thing we're trying to mount, and we put it on a stage, and we get you know, paid a meager wage, and we do whatever that is the bar is much lowered, right? We bring down that bar, now this mediocrity is our excellence, right? Mm -hmm. And we teach our audience to accept it and pay big money mm -hmm. for it, right? So these are, to me, these have all been revelations that have shaped my awareness of theater. None of it has made me not want to do it. I couldn't do something else if I tried, and I have. <laughs> I was just gonna say, and, and you have. <laughs> yeah. uh, I have to keep, 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 keep doing this in whatever way I can. It, it gets better, it gets easier, it probably won't. But what has happened in the last seven years, this experience of American Moore has been extraordinary in a, a, a plethora, a multiplexity of, 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 of ways. Um, Heart-rending, frustrating, angering, uh, uh, deeply uh, 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 destructive in certain physical and emotional ways as well. But that's the work, right? It's all the work. It's all the process of, you know, trial by fire. You know, you bring, take this thing out of the fire and it's been, it's been hardened. It's been, it's been, you know, it is now it is now fine steel, you know, because it's been through all all this work, and it and and it transcends time, and and we should be sure to direct the the your viewership to 
where you can access this this play online uh, you, you, because it needs to be read and and yeah. uh, just reading it, I think, that will give everyone some sense of what it is we've really been talking about here. It'll become, it'll become yeah. immediately clear, I believe. So they can go to Amazon.com. Uh, the play is called American Moore, M-O-O-R, or, or uh, to the publisher's page, Bloomsbury.com. Great. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I just want to say to those of you, first of all, I encourage you to go get it. It is a very profound piece, and it's not about the more as a black character. It is about the way all of Shakespeare's character, all characters are enhanced when we see and are willing to see through other perspectives, other cultural, other ethnic perspectives. And uh, in, we are in an era right now where I think ears are more open to hearing other perspectives than they have been. And and there are many reasons why ears are closed. That's, that's not a blanket negative statement. There are many reasons that we can't hear things and haven't heard things. But we're in a time where we're hearing things, we're listening, we're, we're willing to listen. And, and this particular work, um, it really showed me, and I think it will you, what it felt like for Keith to love Shakespeare. Most of his adult, all of his adult life, and continue to be limited and boxed. And even when he had the breakthrough, someone telling him, well, you can't do it that way, when that way is exactly what was in him, and that way was exactly what Shakespeare was calling out of him. Um, so it's much, to, it's much to our advantage as a culture to let that be expressed. Fair enough? Yeah, that's I couldn't have said it better. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. And I was I was thinking when you talked about the work being hardened um, as steel, it's also the worker. Because I, you know, I've watched you. I've been on just the edges of this. We connect, you know, I don't know every six eight months. Maybe I know what's happening in your life. Uh, but just even from that outside perspective, it made it, it it steeled you as well. I don't mean that in a in a harsh way. There is a stealing, a hardening that's good, that makes you bolder, that makes you better, that makes you more refined. And uh, thank you for putting yourself through that and continuing, even when I know it got hard. <laughs> I'm not gonna argue, it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, Thank you so much for sharing, uh, Keith. I'd, I'd just like to close with a little bit of, of what you're up to now. I know you've been working with Blessed Unrest on a new piece. Um, anything I you have. Like to share with us of what the future holds? I have. I've been working with Blessed Unrest, which is a, 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 a theater company in, in, in Manhattan, on uh, a piece about that, that, it, that is also current about uh, Reparations. Uh, it's really about. I, I, I hesitate to say that because it, because it's really about a whole a whole lot more than that, as as good theater is. But that is the base of it. Some people dealing with navigating, you know, you know, should should money that they have access to be theirs, uh, when if you trace it back, it was all made by slaves. It was all made by slaves the entire country was made by slaves so who owns what uh is the bigger question and, and it's been I'll, I'll be very honest it's been challenging my skills it's <laughs> it is it is it is such a such a, a a a evolving set of complex issues you know very difficult i've also been uh adapting othello i've been working a, a lot through the pandemic months on an adaptation of othello uh, that is really just a, a logical uh, progression from American Moore. And the, the logical question anybody would ask me after looking at American Moore saying, well, what about Othello? Are you going to act in a production? Are you going to direct a production? And my answer would be, well, when, when the play becomes playable, which it is not, it is not uh, if, 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 it, if we just take it from Shakespeare's hands, um, I'm never going to do that play. I'm not interested in that play. Um, 
perhaps I can make it playable. And I have been engaging that process, which is, has been an interesting exercise and some r really exciting things have come out of that. So uh, that's a matter of waiting for, uh, uh, again, the, the road to rise and fortune to grant me the time and resources and uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, position to workshop that with a core of really talented actors because yeah. that's the next step. And yeah. how do we do that? How do we make theater right now? And they're right. trying to figure that right. out, right? I don't, I'm not interested in the Zoom production. Right? <laughs> I'm not interested in a Zoom production either. I've had too many technical issues. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, so those, are the, those, are, those are the prominent projects, right? Yeah. They're, and they're, the, uh, so uh, your, your career took, it took attack from theater Classic theater was, it seems, what you fell in love with. It took a tack from that to TV and film, and then back to theater again. Uh, when I mentioned to a few friends that I was interviewing you today, you know, they of course brought up your, the roles that you created for Young and the Restless and Andromeda, and they would love nothing more than to see Keith Hamilton Cobb back on screen. So is that something that interests you in the future or are you locked into live theater at this point? Well, Tom, let's be honest. I mean, I don't, I don't meet many of my colleagues who in all truth will say, yeah, no, I prefer to make, you know, $600 a week, <laughs> you, you know, and, and work, work, you know, crazy hours and all, all, all the rest rather yeah. than do yeah. a film. Um, on the other hand, there are things in television and film that are quite stilted. They're, 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 they're their own thing. And yeah. you know, they, don't, they, don't, they don't work in a linear way. You don't, you don't start at the beginning and go to the end. You, know? you mm -hmm. don't create and evolve characters in the same way. So while I don't miss Hollywood, I would love to have the means to fund the creative projects that I would like to make, mm. right? So I, 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 I think by having some sort of uh, steady income from that part of the industry, yeah. one can turn one's attention to other creative avenues and support them if nobody else is going to do it for them, yeah. right? Uh, <laughs> and it's funny, our, our, artists, are, artists are weird. I mean, I, you know, when I was in LA, I was making lots of money and I would spend that money on buying exotic woods and, and, and tools to, to make art and, 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 and you know, furniture in my, in my garage. I was always funding my own creative projects. Now, had I been a businessman, I would have figured out a way to sell all those things. But you know, people would come and say, "That's a great table." I say, "You like that? Here, take it." You know, I just say, "I made it here." <laughs> you know, there it is. I'm putting, uh, I'm putting yeah. it out there. This is my contribution to the world. You know, yeah. um, no, no business sense at all. Yeah. It's broken. It doesn't. It's not. You know, it's it's completely broken. It, so so yeah. I'm sort of stuck figuring out the way through with my artist heart and my artist mind, and were Hollywood to call and say, do you want to do this? I couldn't say no, because right. I, I see it. I mean, that's simple math, right? They'll give you money. You can go, you can go figure out a way to pay actors to work on, on that production of Othello, yeah. right? Yeah. You could figure that, you could, that, that, that becomes, that becomes a, a, a less difficult, you know, a no-brainer, as they say. Yeah, yeah. You would oh. get restless, though. <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, and, and, and that's always the case. That's why I never stayed. That's why yeah. I stepped off of every project. Yeah. You know, but I did. I do a couple of years and say, well, this isn't growing. This isn't something that's, you know, I need to go, you know, do the, do the next thing. And, um, I mean, it certainly hasn't been... Uh, the kind of Hollywood career that you know I I I I see I, I people and I envy. I wouldn't want to be them, but I certainly would want right. their means. You know, yeah. who wouldn't love to do you know a film a year and 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 and, and make a, a a large six figures and go off and have the rest of their life to create yeah. stuff elsewhere. I mean, you know, I 
who gets yeah. that right what yeah. what is the what is the the ought 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 one percent that gets that you yeah. know um but it's a lovely fantasy and when you're sitting around thinking who's <laughs> who's who's going to fund your workshop of this who's gonna who's gonna fund you going down in the basement with that group of unseen unheard truth tellers yeah and figuring out yeah. something that's going to make everybody's brains explode when they see it you know I guess you're going to fund it yourself. And you could if you had a TV show. And <laughs> ironically, people would come. Yeah. Right? Yeah. They would come because, because oh, there's the guy at a TV, TV show. celebrity. There's a guy at right? a, a TV show. We're going to go. <laughs> right. 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 We don't care what it's about. We're just going to go. Well, he's he's so doing it. Well, yeah. you know, uh, perhaps the fates have called you to the lesser road, um, which really is doing some deeper things. I mean, I, what you've done with students, what you've done with American Moore, uh, I know that your work has been hard. It hasn't the, received the funding that it should. Um, but what you've done and what you're doing is really important. And culturally, thank you. And, uh, and I have to thank you again. Um, you know, I said it at the beginning, you're, you're just immediately honest and forthright. And uh, I, I thank you for that. I truly do. I value it very much. Well, thank you for having it of me. I'm, I, you know, I, 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 I like to think of myself as a truth teller and, and, and a, a, a person who takes people one at a time you know, and who's ever standing before you, there's a reason for that. Yeah. Your job is to listen and your job is to respond honestly and be authentic. And, you know, not everybody can take that. Just like not everybody can take the truth of the theater that we make. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, they, you know they'll push that away. So uh, I, I need to practice gratitude in the same way uh, for, for anybody accepting that, that, that authentic being of me. Because I don't know how to be something else. I, I, I lie very badly. <laughs> and there, for students of acting, you also just received for free a little acting lesson right there. <laughs> so uh, thanks again, Keith. Seriously, I advise that you get online and look up American More, buy it online, keep track of what Keith's doing. Keith, thank you so much. Thank be you. Be blessed, Tom. and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Okay, man.